I wasn't there when Nigeria became independent, but when I turned 50, actually, a friend uh, gave me one of the most invaluable gifts I've ever got. Uh, a framed copy of Daily Times of 1st of October, 1960. Okay. Right? And I, I still have it. Um, obviously, I have to because you know, it's a collector's item. Yeah. And when I look at just the promise, the sense of expectation that people, Nigerians had on that day and where we are now, I, I, you know, I'm entitled to ask myself whether this is what people, exp you know, what people thought independence should be. Um, obviously, there are not too many anybody who was adult at independence on Independence Day is now will, pro, will now be in their 80s uh, in all likelihood. Um, and the number of people of that age bracket in the country continues to diminish and you know you're probably in the, the tens of thousands with life expectancy at just above 50. Um, and so the reality is I think our country has uh, uh, at some point um, pivoted onto the wrong path. Uh, and, but having said that, I also want to say something else. The problem with Nigeria is not its people. It's its rulers. Okay. Nigerians actually, for the most part, we are terrific to one another. We accommodate one another at the level of daily existence, citizenship, and you see acts of neighborliness every day that defy you, defy all understanding and that will inspire you every day, bar not. The way Nigerians help one another, accommodate one another, inspire one another is totally commendable. Um, but our rulers are, I think, the central part of the problem. Uh, and the kind of ethos of the public space, of our public commons that they have created is part of a central part of why we have got to where we are. And if we don't re-engineer that ethos of the public commons in Nigeria, I think things are not going to be better. This is a central issue in the Nigerian narrative. We don't have common heroes. There are no pan-Nigerian heroes. So you have Yoruba heroes, Awolo, Igbo heroes, Zik, or Juku, uh, Northern heroes, right? Uh, Sadaona, uh, 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 Tafabalewa, uh, Murtala Muhammad, right? But the question is, where is the pan-Nigerian hero? Can you name one? So when we think about our, the labels of our heroes past shall not be in vain. You know, you go to the Niger Delta, you talk of Adaka Boro, or my uh, uh, chief Ina Anthony Nahoro, or you know uh, that kind of thing. Or you know, some people will even say Festo Sokotie, but because he was martyred, right? Uh, he was who say Agu Yorosi, uh, correct? Now you go to the Middle Belt, you say Jay Starka. You will say you know people will even claim Yakubu Gohan, although he grew up in Zaria, right? So this is the thing that a country. Without, you know, you can also talk about Margaret Ebo in the southeast and south south because she was Igbo but married in the south south, right? Um, I, so you, you talk about her, you speak about Gambo Sababa, for instance, in the northwest. You, uh, you look at Abinu Kano, for instance, um, or, you know, um, in the uh, Wazir Ibrahim in the northeast, right? So we have regionalized the idea of heroism and shiroism. But we have not, we don't have a central national narrative of heroism. Someone whose appeal is to Nigeria as Nigeria, not as to parts of Nigeria. And without a country, a country without heroes is not a country. That's the, our central issue here. You've just put your thumb right on it that we've not been able to create a national narrative that every part of Nigeria can buy it. After 64 years of independence. I think we're quite far from it. After the 2023 elections, we are probably furthest from it in my own lifetime. Um, I, I, which is very interesting because 
you know, I, I was born towards the end of the Nigerian Civil War and, you know, my earliest years were in the recovery period of the Nigerian Civil War. But you see, uh, the fact that in my own estimation, and the others may differ here, but in my own estimation, I believe that we are further away from a country which a shared national project now than we were in, say, 1975 or 1978, just in the first decade after the Civil War itself is very interesting because it talks to the kinds of leadership that we've had, right? Now, and, and here, for me, one of the greatest leaders, uh, most understated um, and least appreciated in Nigeria's history, Shem Shagari. Because Shem Shagari invested in trying to bind Nigeria's wounds in the immediate decade after the war. And he had an inspiration for doing so. You know, he came from the, you know, he was there at the foundation of the nationalist movement. He himself was one of the founders of Yamiya Mutane Arewa, right? That's the Northern People's Congress. Okay. And he then held every important position in every government until 66, and then served thereafter in Gowon's cabinet, you know, the National Unity Cabinet, with Awolo Owo, Obasan Joe, the law, and when Awolo re retired or resigned from that cabinet, uh, he became the finance minister in succession to Awolo. And then, of course, the military favored him to then become the head of state in 78, uh, 79. But then he did something remarkable. He was the person who pardoned Gowon. He pardoned Ojuku. He created the context for the return of people like Michael Ock, or although but I returned earlier, these people. And then he didn't stop there. The only Nigerian who has received the Grand Commander of the Federal Republic without being head of state was Obafemi Awolo. The person who conferred that on him as leader of the opposition was Shem Shagari in 1981. And then look at the cabinet he put together in 1983, which Buhari ransacked and refused to let work, right? Uh, when you see the tone that he set, if the leaders who came after him had tried to build on those foundations of trying to forge a common political narrative and bind the woods of the country, we wouldn't be here. Um, and I do think for that, in my view, Shehu Shagari is, for me, one of the greatest presidents this country has ever had. What I like to say is a piece of paper, anybody can write it. But to create that veneration that underpins a constitution, you do need a constitutional settlement or narrative. Yes? That settlement or narrative will precede the at the writing of the constitution. And indeed, when you go into writing the constitution, what then happens is the settlement is what you write up, right? You write it up in a way that makes sense to people and there's fidelity to what was agreed. In Nigeria, we've never had a constitutional settlement. We've never had that underpinning narrative or settlement that binds a constitution together. And that's why it has never worked. So no Nigerian, takes what you say seriously about constitutions, right? But, and as a matter of fact, our constitutions are not written for ordinary people to understand. You know, so when you open them up, you see hearing before, wearing after, hearing this, those things that lawyers use to confuse us and make money. There is no system of government that is not expensive. But ultimately though, you want to get into a situation where uh, the cost of the system is less than the benefits that accrues to it. And that's a matter of ethics in government. It's not about the system of government. The values that underpin government. And here, we've not managed it well. People have, govern, being in government is a revenue stream for those who are in it. Okay? That is not produced by the constitution. That is produced by the conventions and ethics of politics and of public life. And we tend to conflate those two issues. Now, presidentialism does not have to be what it is, that is, uh, principal office holders, uh, advisors, special assistants, personal assistants, uh, special assistants to personal assistants, uh, you know, first ladies, second ladies, uh, uh, wardrobe allowance, and all of them. No, of course not. Those are not related 
to presidential system of government. And, and, and so I'm, I'm not, of course, saying, you know, if we want to scrap the presidential system and go to any other system, that has to be a decision for Nigerians. You know, that's my view. But you, you can bring parliamentary system and it will still be very expensive. You can bring, we tried military government. It was very expensive. <laughs> military, by the way, we're supposed to be, you know, to downsize the costs of government. It did not. So I think well, at the heart of this is one thing. Um, I, I believe it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said the march of civilization is uh, the journey from status to contract, right? Now, this is really the problem. We're, we are a society indexed on status. Everything is an appearance, which is why somebody will want to ride a, a convoy of 50 cars. What are you doing in a convoy of 50 cars? Or in a convoy of even five cars or six cars? What are, so, okay, so you have, let's say, a pilot, a main car, a backup car, and a rear gunner. What else do you, how many other cars can you use? Every other car there is surplusage, burning petrol. Yes? Now, when governors, I'm not even talking about president or vice president, when governors go anywhere, I don't know whether you've noticed. Yeah. Yes? The car that they go with is perpetually on. The governor can come here, where we are now, yes. and stay here for 10 hours. The engine will be running for 10 hours, burning public money. That is not presidentialism, that is stupidity. <laughs> so, it, we have elevated stupidity to an art form, to a form of government, and we blame it on presidentialism. You know, the fact that if you visit a governor or somebody, they must give you a handout. That's not presidentialism. Uh, and that's the thing that I think we've got to try and work on. Distinguishing the, what is essential for a form of a system of government from what it is not. A lot of what we blame on presidentialism isn't part of presidentialism. And in my view, we can make presidentialism work if we are interested. But that requires being interested in forging a common national narrative, a leadership that is interested in building a country for everyone who comes from or lives in it, not just from different for a different uh, for narrow countries, right? Uh, it, it's got to be about building, giving everybody a stake in the project of the country and in taking the country and its citizens seriously. That will take time. It's not going to be forged in a generation. But it can be done in a way that gives you the idea that in increments something is happening. And all of a sudden people begin to discover hope. And people begin to get leaders who speak to them, not at them. Who take them seriously, not looking them as expendable. Who come to par with legitimate votes, not votes manufactured by a chairman of INEC who just reels out numbers from their imagination. If we don't do that, it's not, we're not going to get anywhere. Yes. Uh, I do think it is possible. Now, wherever you were, on the day that the presidential election results were announced in 2015, yeah. there was a sense that something possible could happen in Nigeria. Yeah. And I would never support Buhari, I never supported Buhari. Yes? But on that day, you felt, most people felt good about being Nigerian, including the people who lost the election. Yes? Why was that so? It was not like the election gave you anything. But even, uh, you know, so many people whom I know voted for Jonathan stood up that day and, 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 and sang the national anthem. There was a sense of stake, common stakeholding. And then something changed. Now, it's the same thing. On the day that the National Assembly rejected Obasanjo's third term proposal in 2006, there was a sense of shared pride amongst most Nigerians. So it's not like we've not experienced that before. And for my own generation, on the day that the, uh, on, uh, the June 12 elections took place, um, and you know the annulment of the elections happened 10 days later on 22nd of June 20, 1993, right? But as, uh, at least as that 
was building up and we knew what the outcome was, there was a sense of shared pride. The idea that you actually had somebody who could win across the country in a count that looked credible was unimaginable for, to many people. So is it possible to forge these kinds of things? Of course it is. And Nigerians are not idiots. Nigerians are not asking for miracles. No. No, are they asking for miracle workers or saints or perfectionists? No. We know people will make mistakes. But when people give the country good service, we know. When they have not given good service, we also know. And that really is the point here. And I do think it is possible for us to come up with leadership that can give good service and in whom we can take pride. Absolutely, yes. Have I seen some of those in my lifetime? Yes, I have. It's destroyed the implicit bargains that underpin democracy, which is the foundation of elective government in popular legitimacy. Sometimes you see the judgments and you can see something, it, it, you know, the judgments are so manifestly crooked, you know something has gone wrong in this. Uh, but th so the judges effectively have toppled the people as the sources of popular legitimacy and install themselves as the origins uh, of legitimacy, which is not popular. And so politicians' elections are no longer determined by the people or administered by INEC. Elections are now administered by courts, determined by courts, and judges have, are the only people who have votes. So as I like to say now, democratic politics is about one person, one vote. In Nigeria, our democratic politics in court now is about one person, no vote. The only people who have the vote to determine who wins an election are judges. So the only suffrage you have in Nigeria is judicial suffrage, not universal suffrage. That is where we are. And that is the biggest price we are paying for the colossal corruption of our judiciary. It tells you everything that is wrong with the Tinubu <laughs> government. Everything. If you're going to be changing a national anthem, right? At the minimum you can do is involve their own people because it is their song. It's not a plutocracy. It's not a chinibucracy. It's not an apabiocracy. It is a democracy. It's about the people, right? That, uh, the, so just grant the people a public hearing. Grant the people participation in the process. And when they have done, if you want to rig the votes, just even make the effort to appear to think or to care about whether or not the people should count. Or well, is that asking for too much? So that national anthem issue is really the biggest evidence of where we are with the current uh, regime. But as I said, I said there was something I described and told you, hold this page. Hold this page. Two years from now, we'll return to that page. <laughs>